Hello, and welcome to uh, the presentation. We'll, we'll be talking about how um, some development that has been happening in Swift over the past few years and continuing about how we can extend Swift to support all the third-party storage systems. My name is Luis Pavon, and I work in Red Hat Storage, and I'm here with my colleagues. We got Prashant Pai from Red Hat Storage and Pete Sisev also from uh, Red Hat OpenStack. So first, if you are new to the Swift architecture, let me just take you through it a little bit. Well, because we're going to start talking a little bit about each one of these servers. So the way it, wor it works, we got four servers in the Swift architecture. One is the proxy server, which is the one listening in to requests coming in from the outside. And this job is then to define and decide what other server is going to talk to. We got the account server, which really is a metadata server. And his job is to have a collection of containers. So the account in Swift, you can call it in OpenStack the tenant uh, server or the project is what it translates to. Then we have the containers, which is another metadata server. And his job is to, have, to be a collection of all the objects located inside that container. And if you're from S3, you can think of a container as a bucket. So, and then we have the object server. The object server's job is to actually take the data coming from the proxy, being sent by the customer or the user, and actually place that data on some system, in some file system, and store it. So this architecture works really well for Swift. But what if we want to extend it to other third-party systems? What can we do? So back in 2013, a new class was added to the Swift uh, uh, project called disk file. Now, don't get confused. I, myself, first time I heard it when I was new to Swift, I was thinking, but why would a class called disk file in an object store? But anyway, it's called disk file. And what it does is you are able to create your own disk file class and plug in to the object server. And with that, you can decide how is it that you're going to store data on the file system itself. And this has been around since 2013, so it's been almost two years it's been around. So that's great. It was excellent. Too. A lot of companies, a few companies started using it. But then we said, OK, that means that the entire Swift cluster right now has to use the same disk file. So we cannot segregate. So maybe we have, want to put uh, some data objects in one type of uh, storage system. And so we need something else. So back in Juno, there was some a new technology added into Swift called storage policies. And what that does is decide, depending on the container, it allows segregation of the objects. For example, if you want to put an object in two times the uh, replication or three times replication, you can have uh, objects on faster uh, storage systems with SSDs. So depending on the container, you can decide where actually to place the data. And this works really well for third-party systems because now you have disk file and you have storage policies. And now you can decide per container where your objects are going to go and lie in. So this has been available since Juno. So we're going to take an example of a storage policy that uses disk file. And this one's called Swift on file. So if you were at my uh, other talk with IBM on Monday, this will seem a little familiar to you. So Swift on file, what it does is a storage policy with a plugin for disk file. Then what it does is that it takes objects and places them directly on a clustered file system. And what it does is it takes the maps the URL, and it sees the map, the URL path, and takes it verbatim, creating the directories that it needs to do on the cluster file system. So for example, here's an object being sent by a user with account container and object. And Swift, what it does today, it creates it. It actually lays it on the file system, as, as you can see here, which is kind of complicated to see. But what Swift on file does is that it takes that path and actually lays it down on the file system, as you can see here. So it's very easy to find on the cluster file system. Why would you want to do that? What is the benefit of this? Well, let's take an example. And again, this comes from Monday's presentation. Here we have an example of analytics. We take 
and we ingest into our cluster file system using a Swift API. Then we have an event that happens where we have Hadoop come up and run the queries right on the cluster file system using a Hadoop connector. So there's no more copying and copying out into Swift. You're running right on the same file system. Once the results happen, they will be variable on the file system to be used uh, from gets all over Swift. Let's take a look at another example. In here we have what we, all of us do today, we take pictures with our phones, we post them over an object interface into some cloud system. And in this model, what we have here is that the pictures come down over a Swift interface. They go into a cluster file system with a unified namespace. And then they are accessible over, for example, new VMs that then can transcode that information into other bit rates. So for example, if you had, I don't know, a 4K camera and you take a movie, then you post the movie over Swift, then you could have many VMs act on that movie just by accessing over the scale-out file system. Okay, so that's great. But we have two other servers that we need to talk about, if you remember the architecture. We talked about the object server, that's working very well. What about the container and account server? What if you have other methods of representing what objects you have in your cluster file system and how you represent the collection of objects in your file system? So what we have in development is something called pluggable backends. And with this, uh, Pete is going to talk about this. All right. OK. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, pluggable backends um, are an API that existed for a while. And um, it's probably the oldest uh, actually still open review. And uh, in a sense, an experiment of um, having a code which is part of Swift, but it's not actually Swift. It's a, it, but I don't want to say that this is a fork. It, it's ultimate goal here is to get it into Swift. Um, so um, it was intended to support um, Lucy's work in, in GlusterFS. And, um, uh, it was a companion to Peter Portenta's um, disk file that Louis just explained. And we kind of worked on it together. And, I, and you can see that we're not very inventive at naming. But um, it is actually what it is. It's a, it's a back-end API. So that's why it's called that way. Unfortunately, it was a little bit more challenging. Uh, I'm not saying to, it's not to say that disk file was like trivial or something, not at all. But it was different because there was way more methods um, in that class that had to be abstracted and redefined and stuff like that. So it uh, took a while, so it had this long history. And um, um, while this was going on, we had um, some changes in Swift occurring. Uh, in particular, storage policies, I think, were the most um, learning experience in, in pluggable backends because they introduced some changes to those classes. And, um, and it became abundantly clear that the initial idea to create a stable API that we would publish somewhere once and then just have everyone plug into it is probably not going to happen just because Swift is a living thing and um, uh, that's the nature of it. So, so it's still an API, um, still an important one, but it's not going to be cast in stone forever because it, you will see, I'll just show a picture. Here it is. That's where it goes. And the PBE is pluggable backend, acronym for it. And um, this is equivalent of picture everyone see before, but um, just all the extra stuff removed. But, so you just see the proxy and account containers. Um, it plugs in about the same, same place where disk file plugs right now, but disk file is for object and this is for account container. And, and, because of, and you can see that this is kind of inside the Swift still. Uh, we try to push it as, 
as low as possible. This, this way, um, firstly, uh, you have to, like, for example, if you're some vendor, like Seagate, for example, and want to implement this interface, the lower I push it, the less, less stuff you have to code. Um, so so that's, why, that's why it's so, so low on this. And the second, all the changes in the churn, like storage policy and stuff, they, the further I get away from them, the, the less churn happens in this interface. So I'm not, claiming, not making that claim of a custom stone public interface anymore, but I want to be friendly to implementers. So this way, um, the lower it goes, then, um, the more stable it, uh, it becomes because it, then it changes with the technology, not with the um, user requirements. So uh, um, one thing that um, a lot of guys noticed here is that because of this desire, like for, for the reasons I just explained, uh, it's on the other side of the network hop from the proxy. So uh, whenever you use this thing, uh, you incur this uh, network uh, network hope. And um, it was kind of, mm, not a contention point, but uh, it was an observation that another people, n a number of people made. Like, every, you propose this NPI that has this network hope baked into it, and uh, it's probably not a good thing. But um, fortunately, uh, some very clever guy, or actually two of them, uh, came up with a way to do it, and uh, Pi is gonna talk about it later. So. Let me just move, move on real quick to what we are up to. So um, there's just a, a bunch of things that still need to be done. Um, in particular, Swift on file uh, goes through something else. Or, or rather, it uses the same class that PBE sub, uh, like changes. Uh, so it's uh, like a version behind PBE and the uh, that's probably the biggest thing uh, that we need to do. Another, I wrote adapter Azure codes, and uh, that was, in my mind, the biggest thing. And I learned just, and it's not in this presentation, I learned that like half an hour, that probably the biggest challenge is gonna be container sharding. Because that thing, um, I, the inventor of the sharding, uh, Matt Oliver, just, put the sharding into the, uh, well, basically I have to create the same method that he does for PBE, and, uh, and that thing creates the shard tree. <laughs> so yeah, there is a lot of work. Uh, and as you can see, uh, but uh, the, the good thing is that it's useful, or and useful and usable. You can check out a, a, a tree, or that review that um, mentioned in the, in the presentation and just use it, just write code to it and, uh, and expect it to work. Um, and I guess the rest is just to, like, to appeal to people to start using it, yeah, just maybe without waiting until I get it, in, until I get it in. Just use that review as a, as a patch to, to your Swift. And um, it's almost always up to date, uh, up to the new Swift. And uh, now I think uh, next is Pi, uh, talking about that thing that I incurred and uh, how he helps me to, right? Mm -hmm. Here you go. Thank you, Pete. Okay, um, yeah. we'll talk about a single process work that's been going on for some time. The single process is really a very simple uh, optimization so when you have scenarios where uh, Swift is backed up by a third-party clustered file system such as um, GPFS or ClusterFS or even CephFS, um, a lot of heavy lifting and, and the meat is, is, is done by the clustered file system. So when you have Swift uh, backed by a clustered file system, the distribution and replication is usually done by the clustered file system. So you have Swift. Uh, which is capable of doing replication and distribution in the proxy server. And you have the clustered file system also capable of doing the same thing. So there's no easy knob to turn off the distribution and replication. And as of today, how we 
uh, turn off or sort of suppress uh, Swift's distribution uh, is through storage policies, like uh, Luis explained. So what storage policies um, allow uh, the backends to do is um, uh, it can allow the user request to be routed to a particular object server, which talks to a clustered file system backend. And how do we suppress um, replication? As of today, we hard code uh, replication as, as uh, one uh, when we uh, build the ring files. So um, if you see this setup where you have Swift in front and the clustered file system talking to the disk, um, so the hop between the proxy and uh, the object server is is really not necessary. So as of today, the way the only way you can reduce latency is to collocate proxy and the object on the same node, but they still run as two different processes. So the client request uh, that proxy accepts, it's it is still forwarded to the object server over the network, which uh, involves the network overhead and uh, the HTTP overhead. So the proposal is is very simple. Uh, move the object server functionality into proxy and run as a single process. So um, this is an example. So as of today, when the users uh, send a request, get or put to a proxy server, um, the proxy server refers to the storage policy, uh, which could be the default storage policy or uh, set on a particular container. And it routes that request to the right object server based on the storage policy. So that is how we override, uh, sort of override Swift's uh, distribution at the proxy level. And once the request comes to object server, so object server has this cool thing called disk file API, and Swift on file is a disk file API implementation. So Swift on file can talk to any um, POSIX based clustered file system. So um, in this example, Swift on file disk file API uh, talks to the disk uh, through clusterFS. So when the request is forwarded from the uh, proxy to object, uh, the object server talks to ClusterFS, and ClusterFS is the one that uh, that sort of uh, does the distribution among the cluster nodes and also the replication among the cluster nodes. So if you see here, uh, the hop between proxy and object server is not not really uh, that something uh, relevant and useful. So what we are getting at is is this where we remove that hop between proxy and object server, so they just run as a single process. So the client request that is uh, accepted by the proxy is directly sent to uh, the clustered file system in the back end. Um, so how are we going to do this in Swift as of today? So um, we did some SS bench, uh, benchmark recently uh, with uh, cluster of S, uh, and uh, older version of Swift and Swift on file. So this is done on a older change, so a lot of this is obsolete as of now. Uh, but as you can see, uh, there's a lot of improvement for uh, small file object puts, uh, and it, it in improves. Um, uh, you can uh, leverage this work when you have uh, multiple proxy workers uh, and multiple users accessing the cluster uh, simultaneously. So. Um, how are we going to do this in terms of implementation? So um, erasure coding was, uh, was beta in this uh, Kilo release in Swift. And it brings in some new concepts, such as uh, policy type and multiple object controllers. So object controllers is the one that, uh, that kind of talks to the disk file API. And as of today, we have uh, two policy types. One is replication, and another is uh, erasure coding. So the proposal is to introduce a single replica policy type, which uh, clustered file systems can make use of. And, and the single process optimization, uh, if you see, uh, although in the reference implementation it's tied up uh, to the single replica policy type, it need, it need not be. You could still have uh, three replicas with the single uh, policy optimization. So right now there's a, a patch up there sent by Chiago so what it does is uh, it will combine proxy and object as a single process. But once uh, Pete's work on, uh, on pluggable backends is done, uh, maybe we can get into a, sort of a 
PACO process where you have all the processes running as a single process uh, talking to uh, the disk file, uh, uh, to the uh, clustered file system backend. So, so how does all these efforts, the pluggable backends and, and the single process optimization uh, fit in as, as sort of pieces of a puzzle and, and how they uh, allow third party file systems to uh, plug better into Swift? I'll, I think Lewis is going to take it. Thank you. Prasad? Okay, so you've seen the technology, you've seen what we were trying to do. What is the ultimate goal of this, of these projects that we've been doing for the last few years? What we're really looking for is a well-defined storage interface for Swift. What that will allow is storage file systems, third-party systems, to be able to benefit from all the middleware that's out there for the proxy, and then send that data to your third-party storage systems. That is the goal. I'm sure it's just a start of a conversation. I don't want to say that this is the way it's going to be. This is just the beginning. This is what we'd like to go to. This allows things like, for example, archival. You have your, maybe your own methods of storing the data, your own methods of uh, make sure maybe you don't want, like, warm, you don't want to, the data to be deleted and your own methods of determining how the container and the account will be set up for that. For example, in GlusterFS, a container may not actually be the container that it is today, which is a database where we look for how many objects actually inside that container. We may just go into the file system and determine what objects are in the file system to completely bypass uh, the container database. In Ceph, there's uh, a lot of work there that we need to decide what to do, but there's possibilities of maybe using the Rados gateway to benefit from the middleware on the proxy. We also have tape. In tape, you can use something like the uh, tape file system in the back end and decide on how is it you're going to decide how you're going to um, enable the container, decide what objects are going to be there and such. And then we have the kinetic address from Seagate that can be plugged in here also. But again, this is community work. What? I want to bring an idea and say, this is not the way it's going to be. This is just an idea. We want to bring it to the community. We want to work with the communities and decide how is it that we're going to go forward from here. Because really, the only way to innovate together is to work through community work. So I'll make sure I bring that up. So I look forward to working with the Swift community on these ideas. So that's what we have. Any questions? Please use the mic. You, you said that you're going from a replication factor of three to a replication factor of one uh, with your backend. The question that I have is uh, how is this not introducing a single point of failure? The, we, we're talking specifically to Swift on file, uh, its method. What it does is that it leverages the storage backend. So GlusterFS has two or three replicas itself. So it's just leveraging. We pass that, that technology over to the cluster file system. Same thing, for example, if it was GPFS or if it was CFFS. You pass that over to that file system, it keeps that data safe. And, uh, and if you're talking about single point of failure in terms of network, uh, you can have uh, multiple processes with proxy and object behind a load balancer. I think that would also help. Uh, but, don't we, but don't we introduce a uh, pretty big dependency on the uh, redundancy inside the, uh, the, the plugged-in uh, storage subsystem. I mean, one, one methodology that you can use right now is simply mount the file system from, or file systems from, let's say, a SAN or from, from whatever backend you want. That's in right. The, in the devices. Uh, but if you, if you start integrating the proxy server and the storage server, and uh, my, try, uh, try to uh, move it into the direction of uh, essentially getting rid of the whole core. Uh, I think it, if I can just interrupt, I think it all depends what you want to do. For example, in Swift file is going after a certain number of use cases. And those use cases define that the objects that are placed on the cluster file system are accessible also from other NAS protocols. So it depends. We don't want to replace Swift completely. This is not what the goal of this project is. 
We just want to enable other use cases with this technology. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Can actually use both of them in the same cluster uh, with the policy. Like default policy zero goes to the legacy backend, which is super safe. So going back to your going back to your ultimate uh, goal here, you're trying to basically provide a POSIX interface in front of an object interface, but I see you do going in the backward direction where you're actually using the object interface to pipe in the data at the back end to a clustered file system. Why would you want to do that? I mean, the whole idea I thought behind building an object interface is innovation, right? And to allow people and legacy applications to come in and put their data onto objects. So I'm a little confused here. Yeah, I think that's, you're right. There's two different things. When we're talking about the plugin that we have today, the Swiftum file one, it is very specific for cluster file systems. But from, for example, other views, it all, it's, it is just an interface on how the data is written somewhere. It is, doesn't define that as POSIX. Swiftum file does that because it is a specific use case. But the APIs that are available that we're trying to work on do not define it as a POSIX interface. It defines it as a class that you can uh, subclass and do your own way. For example, Kinet. Kinetic drives are not POSIX at all. And they, they are on another object store. So it all depends how you want to in implement it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and if you have seen the uh, keynote by Digital Film Tree uh, with the nice demo on Monday, so what they do is uh, they took the 4K video of the audience and uploaded it to Swift. And what I'm assuming is, is the VFX software that the other guy is running there doesn't talk object. So I, I'm guessing what he does is he gets it from Swift, edits it, because the VFX software talks to a file, and then puts it back in Swift. So if he had used something like this, he could just open it on the, um, through the file system interface without incurring the get and put again. Mm -hmm. Hi, I very much like what you're trying to do, where you're enabling the Swift API to be consumed ubiquitously in front of any file system. My question is, how do you prevent Swift from doing bad things? For example, if the file comes in through the NAS, and then I want to pull it out through the Swift side, mm -hmm. it's obviously going to be missing some metadata, like the e-tag, yes. and that could have the auditor erasing files that we don't want it to erase, and it could have client software that's expecting an e-tag, or maybe the e-tag has changed because it went in through Swift and it got modified by Hadoop to reject the actual um, put that's returned. So how do you um, enable that, or what's your proposal? Today is not very optimized for that. Okay. Today what we do is we look at the file that has been placed there. Please let me know if I'm wrong. And oh, the right. e-tag is not there. We calculate it. Okay. And so it's two reads. It's the read for the e-tag and then the e-read to send it back. And then do you disable the auditor so that it doesn't yeah. or you calculate every time on the fly? Yes, that's yeah. what the uh, replication number one does. You just don't start that auditor at all. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Hi guys, I'd just like to uh, amplify uh, and ask a very similar question with a slightly different flavor that Monu asked slightly earlier. Okay. Um, you seem to be having difficulty in differentiating between file systems and file protocols. A file system tells you how to store your data. A file protocol tells you how to get access to your data. Yes. And I'm seeing a slight blurring of the lines here, which may be desirable, but leaves you open to all sorts of problems in that you're no longer um, if you like playing in one camp or the other, how do you, how you, there are two questions to this. First of all, how are you going to resolve this? Because nobody really wants a file system that's a file protocol or vice versa. We've been there, done that, and it really doesn't fly very well. And the second point about that is that we're now mixing up POSIX compliance with object storage. And, you know, I was always taught, mention locking an object in the same sentence and you've got a sentence that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So how, how, do you, how are you going to fix those two problems? The second one is actually kind of easy because the Swiftum file is just an application sitting on top of LustreFS in our implementation. So it is just as any other application handles locking with any other uh, application in the same cluster. The first one is a little bit harder to answer. Uh, and the only one I can answer is with this. <laughs> 
It really so the guy in the left is the file protocol and the guy in the right is the file <laughs> yeah, system? Yeah, exactly. The, uh, so. Mainly what it means is that it, it's, it's, it's about community work. So we, we don't have all the answers. We are looking for help uh, in, in this, in this uh, technology. Yeah, uh, I, I have a somewhat different take on it from Luis. <laughs> it's not contradictory, but, but different. Is that the goal here is to allow non-POSIX. So uh, pieces and POSIX that are like outside of this, they're probably going to be not supported, just stub. And uh, that includes locking. For example, there is no such thing on Kinetic, and you can plug Kinetic. Actually, you have already, it already is plugged into disk file, so all that's left is PBE. Uh, as long as this is a goal, this interface cannot be too specific to POSIX. So parts of it are probably going to like return an error if you try to do it. You, you, there's, there's, but there's an implicit problem here in, in my limited thinking. I mean, I'm not... Yeah, so, so basically, like, when you need locking, like, you, you cannot place, for example, a mail spool onto this thing and then have object access to it. So that's probably not going to work. But you are allowing us, for instance, to ingest via Swift. Mm -hmm. Swift and Flow yeah. being an so, example uh, of that, so and yes, then access yes. via NFS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we are, there is a specific use case, and uh, that actually is exist. It's not hypothetical. Uh, people were already doing this kind of thing. It's like a you know specific example I have, and I, I, I know f for sure that people do use this, is FFmpeg that just uh, ingests from Swift um, because it's, it needs this POSIX interface. But it's not locking anything. It just reads, and, and we made the read, these reads to work, so that application works fine. So, 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 yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I'm asking too many questions, and I apologize to everybody else, but the, the one, and I perhaps should talk to you afterwards, the thing I'm having difficulty with is perhaps differentiating by what, is, what, what you are meaning when I see, hear you talk about file, and yet you use the word object, and then you use the word object, and I hear file, because I'm not, I'm, I'm beginning to misunderstand the position of Swift, then, if you're trying to support other, exactly, the piece underneath is, it, it's, it's, there are two things in there. There are file-based things and there are object-based things, mm. and so what? What is the what is the what is the storage interface going to be? Object-based or file-based or both? It can be both, surely. You see what I'm meaning about yeah, the difference between file systems and file protocols? Yeah, let, I just want to make sure that we don't confuse the example of Swift and file with what we're trying to do here. No, I understand that. Yeah, yeah. 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 All we're trying to say here is that we have a well-defined interface, just like a device driver on a kernel, which allows you to take data coming from the stream and, and move it in the direction that you want to in, uh, save it as. That's, that's it. We don't try to define how you're going to define, uh, save the data. That is up to the developer. And the defined interface should not define that. It's only the stream of data that's coming through through the proxy and being passed to your class, and it's then that class deciding how then to save that. Does that make sense? We're not trying to say that it's POSIX. We don't try to say that it's anything. It's, it is a stream of data that's coming through, and it's allowing you to decide how you're going to save that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anything else? All right, thank you.